uh, this isn't a tool I use, but I, I was speaking to um, a woman who's an entrepreneur and she said that she always asks in the interview process, do you shop in TK Maxx? And if they say no, then she doesn't hire them. Whereas if they say yes, she sees it as there's a lot of characteristics of someone who shops in TK Maxx who's very good for... How's it going, people? Welcome back to the Here's the Crack podcast. Um, we have another guest on. I feel like I say this all the time because we're just getting guests on all the time. David Johnson, how's it going? Lovely to meet you guys. Thanks for having me. No problem. And um, I think the best place to start off is where we start off with all of them and throw it over to you. And if you want to introduce yourself, tell us a bit about yourself, who you are and what is it you do. So my name is David Johnston. Um, I'm the founder of Outside In. So for those who don't know, Outside In is a, a streetwear brand based in Belfast. Um, and it's all centered around giving back to um, people experiencing homelessness. I uh, started in 2016. So we're just um, over a four year mark. Um, we've donated over 60,000 products across the world and counting. So it's uh, been a fun journey so far. Yeah. 60,000 products, like it's, that's uh, a lot. Crazy. Yeah, not, not all at once, but over those four years. And I think, um, yeah, it's the orders kind of as they grow, we kind of see the the donated products growing and, and even the charity, like the charities we partner with, like expand across the world as well. So with New York, LA, South, uh, South Africa as well. So yeah. Um, that's the exciting That's part for me. Mind. I love just seeing like where we can kind of reach um, through donations as well. What yeah. way does your donation system work? Is it like, I know I've heard it's like you buy one item and you donate one item. Yeah. So Is... we started it. Do you want me to kind of like explain where that, like even the idea came from or yeah. 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 Very yeah. Much like I never had like a passion for homelessness before. Like it was something I was always aware of when I saw like people in the streets but it wasn't until I got involved in like street street photography at university. Um, and my friend, he kind of started a page like it's similar to Humans in New York, but he called it Humans of Edinburgh. So we went down to Edinburgh, got to know a lot of people just randomly in the street, asking them what's their story. But then one day we kind of got to know people experiencing homelessness and it totally changed my perception when I actually sat down and heard not only their name, but why they were on the street. And I think before that, I'd always had credit preconceptions, or maybe it was just as we grew up, we're told like stranger danger, or these people are alcoholics or drug abusers. But when I actually heard why they were on drugs or why they were on alcohol, it kind of humanized that person. So I find it hard um, to walk past again. I kind of created this connection that I didn't have. So I realized that these were amazing stories. And as we had this platform, I was like, I want to share their story with their permission. And a lot of the time when we shared the stories, opportunities arose from this. So I was like, this is amazing. Like I'm connecting people with um, people who, who are in need. And what I actually created was job opportunities. It created so much more than that. So that started like, like spitballing ideas for me. I was like, right, I love storytelling. I love that we can actually connect society and help people at the same time. And then after university came home, I was like, right, well, I've done with Humans of Edinburgh, what do I do now? And I started volunteering with a lot of charities over here, homeless charities, just to see what the need was. But I also traveled that summer. It was during the Euros 2016. So I was in France and then I was in South Africa. And when I was there, I realized there's homelessness is a global issue because no matter where I went, there were people living on the streets. And I was like, why is it in 2016 that it's become nearly a social norm to walk past someone in need? And I found myself doing it for years. So it's like looking at people kind of walking past being like, not judging them, but being like, you don't see this person. And then I realized, but I didn't see that person. So nearly after that, I was like, I have to do something here. I don't know what I'm going to, I had a business management degree, had looked at potential jobs that I could go into. But for me, that really stood out. It's like, I want to do something that's going to make a difference. It was inspired by Tom's and their kind of given model um, where they do buy one, give one. So you buy a pair of shoes, they give one to someone in need. But for me, the main reason was I wanted to get people to actually be a part of the giving process. So I looked at Tom's and thought it's great. You buy one and you actually like they give one out for you. But for me, the whole challenge was connection, storytelling. And I was like, if I just do all the giving for everyone, it's hard to maybe get people to connect. So it's like, imagine we actually give people two products. So if they buy a hat, we give them two hats and challenge them to give one out to someone experiencing homelessness. So that's kind of where the idea started um, in 2016, just started with hats. It's kind of evolved now to different given products. Um, during lockdown, we've kind of went back to not giving the given products to the customers just for now, just with COVID and being careful with vulnerable adults on the streets. But I think that's kind of what's 
excited me the most is hearing all the stories of people around the world, not just being inspired by our business model, but then doing something about it and actually stopping and saying hello to people in the streets, giving them these practical products and building connections and helping to like network nearly to get people off the streets where it's like, I always say business and business networking is the key to success, but imagine creating networking opportunities for individuals who are experiencing homelessness in a way that they have skills, they have stories, and someone's going to be able to help eventually if seven people stop every day, then what's 49 a week? There's going to be someone there who has a skill or a contact who's going to be able to help that person. So that's kind of where it started in 2016 with that model. And we've always wanted to keep sure, whether it's even in the midst of COVID, how do we connect our followers to people experiencing homelessness and educate them to what's going on? Yeah, you you said there that you had like first hand experience of speaking to homeless people and learning their stories. Mm-hmm. When you were doing that, was there any like particular stories that have stood out for you and stuck with you? Yeah, there like there's been a few different ones. I think one of the main ones for me was a guy John, um, who lived in Edinburgh. And for me, when I first spoke to him, he was kind of a bit distressed, and I was like, "What's up?" So I sat beside him, and I was just like talking about how basically throughout his life he had just like things had just spiraled out of control from losing one of his kids um and then he got into alcohol his his um his wife then left him and then he he found himself in the street things just got worse and worse but i think for him he like for me it was just more that he he had a story but through that he told me how much he loved dogs and he was just like i have such a like he had a dog with him and he was just like he told me kind of all the, the hard things in his life, but it was just this one little bit of hope and it was having a dog for him meant that it was worth it. And it was someone he was looking after. It was someone he was able to provide for that he, even though he had maybe lost his son, lost his wife, he was like, this is someone I'm like looking for. And that was kind of his reason to keep going. But from that, we then were able to get him involved in Dogs Trust to see potentially getting him a placement. So I think for me, that was just one of the stories that kind of stood out that created an opportunity through that. And then there was another one in Glasgow um, where I met an individual who had come from um, Egypt. And so in Glasgow City Mission, it's like an amazing charity in the heart of Glasgow. And this guy had been a lawyer, um, one of the top lawyers in Egypt, but he kind of went against the the revolution at the time. And he had a bounty on his head, had to escape into London, found his way up to Glasgow. And him and his wife and his daughter um, had literally just become refugees when we're living um from with food banks and he said i'd only met this guy it was kind of getting to the end of the day and i just felt challenged to go and speak to him because it was in the center and i, I saw him kind of smile so it's like i'm gonna go sit down and i was tired but i was like i want to hear a story and when i heard this story it just blew me away because he said he was one of the top lawyers that he used to do all these cases um for people to help them just who couldn't afford um lawyers but then he was like david why is it that like I now find myself in this situation where it's reversed, where I'm now needing to go to food banks. I'm now needing to um, have housing and opportunities come my way. And I think he had created this whole regime, like he had created and with it during the time he had documented all the things that were happening in the regime that weren't right. And that's kind of why the bounty was put in his head. But he wanted me to have his book that he had created that had got him kind of where to where he was. And that I only knew this guy for maybe 15, 20 minutes, but we had built a connection in that time where he felt confident enough to send me this to show me what he had done. And even the next day when we were leaving Glasgow, he traveled half an hour by foot just to come and say goodbye to me because he knew I was going away. And I think that even stood out for me. I was like, this guy only met me for 20 minutes, but he's traveled 30 minutes just to say goodbye. And I think that's what really struck me is that it doesn't take long to connect with someone it can be 10 minutes it can be half an hour it can be an hour but that can change someone's life and I think it's never underestimate the power of connection or power of conversation because I was inspired by his story and was able to tell him how incredible he was to keep fighting to keep going for what he believed in but at the same time then I yeah he he was inspired by like kind of what we were doing at the same time so it was just this amazing like opportunity where I feel like now I, anytime I meet anyone just everyone has an amazing story and I always love finding out like the background of of where we find ourselves because I would have never known if I had sat down and said hey where are you from what's your story what what brought you here yeah and one thing that's one thing that kind of stands out there is um obviously you're like I feel like we've been talking very briefly but 
at the start you you refer obviously a lot of people would say like a homeless person but you would say people who are struggling with homelessness yeah. is that kind of something that you're challenging there because obviously you know when you're walking along the street and you see someone you would probably just say oh there's a homeless person whereas you kind of put a wee sort of twist on the word is that for any other reason like or just it's something different? that we've learned over time to, i wouldn't say that i just learned this like 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 four years ago or five years ago i think it was over time the more we spoke to charities and the more we got to know people it's like the per it's a person it's like and i think if we label homeless person it very much all the stigmatism start arising but what we realize is it's a person experiencing homelessness so that could be for a week that could be for a month that could be a year but it humanizes that person to not be labeled as a stereotype and i think at outside in we always say we want to change perceptions of homelessness it's like we want to make it a topic that people are willing to speak about we want people to be educated so that they understand that okay that guy that's on your street has a story and um, that he has a family that he could be a father it could be um it could be a son and i think when you look at it that way it changes your perception to see that actually like there's a human behind that person I walk past every day. So I think it is important that we kind of change that. And it's, it's maybe it'll take time for, I think society to start using terminology like that. But I think there's so many amazing charities out there and we have this platform of outside in. And I think education is a big way that we can kind of break those yeah. stigmatisms. I think it, I think it is strange though, the way like changing that can change your perception because i know like that's one thing i've been thinking about for the past few minutes is just the way you've said that is like if i think being blunt if i if someone says like that's a homeless person i immediately think of the stereotypes you know like obviously alcohol abuse and drug abuse and stuff but the way you're saying that like a person struggle a person like what what's the way you say a person experiencing experience homelessness it kind of does humanize and it almost is more like a compassionate you feel more compassionate towards that yeah. which is strange uh that's strange yeah <laughs> but yeah well, um, what would you say to someone who, or like people who do you believe like the stigma that homelessness is just down to like alcohol abuse and drug abuse that you know yeah no i think and that's a really good question because i think there is We've had a lot of people, like if we do pop-ups around the UK, people come up and be like, oh, I don't help people who are experiencing homelessness because um, they deserve it. Or if they're on alcohol, why would I give them money? Or there, there's a lot of things. And I totally understand sometimes that people have maybe had a negative perception of maybe meeting someone on the street. But I think it's really down to stopping and seeing like, why are they in that scenario? Or like what caused them to get into that? Um, but I think it very much what you realize is it could be anyone. And I think when you realize, because I've seen like top businessmen, people who had like million pound businesses on the street, I've seen artists on the street who are incredible, people with first class honors degrees. And I think if we start seeing those kind of like, not that that needs to be the highlight of like, these are the top people experiencing homelessness. But I think when you realize it's not someone who from 16 was on alcohol their whole life, sometimes it can be just one thing that went wrong. And we all kind of have those moments or maybe we're just fortunate that we have a family or a good friend network that can kind of help us get back on track. And I think I, I think the best example is lockdown. It's like we've all, we all know what it feels to be isolated. We all know what it feels to be lonely, like to get caught in our own like thoughts. And I think if we can understand what that's like and we're in a home, like what is that not like for someone who's been walked past every day or someone who's living in a hostel or maybe in a like kids in care that maybe don't have those connections or never have had we get to go back into these communities and have people again but they're kind of not really having anything to look forward to because it's like well, we've been in this scenario for years so i think it's it is hard to break those stigmatisms but i think the more that we can share stories or the more that we can like show people like there's a guy we met in tottenham court road in london he used to work for jamie oliver and gordon ramsay um and similar stillborn baby that caused him to spiral into alcohol, couldn't manage the stores anymore and find himself living, like literally sleeping on the street. Um, so I think for us, we wanted to share that story and he gave us his permission. But I think the more that you hear those people, you're like, Flip, that was someone who was managing 19 restaurants. Um, yeah. Like you, you start humanizing them a lot more. Do you think now even like everyone's obviously becoming a lot more aware, aware of what like mental health, like a lot of the examples you're given there is like, people who have went through like proper trauma like mm -hmm. losing a child and things and like just don't know how to deal with it like would you say that 
you know, like more like mental health charities and stuff would be helping with homelessness as well as like. Yeah, we, we definitely, we've, we chatted to a few charities in London and what they're starting to do is like hire in therapists and hire in counselling because what they found is like, right, we can meet the need in terms of like food and, and the, the real necessities. But to see long-term change, there has to be like, we can't just put people into housing and expect them to sort their life out. And there's so many people who just think, oh, open all the buildings in Belfast and put them all in there. But that doesn't solve the the kind of mental health issues that we're kind of talking about here, of like isolation or trauma. or And I think to really get people, as we say, bringing people from the outside back into society, there has to be a change in, in how we, we can't just umbrella the term homelessness and expect everyone to go through a system of like, get your house and you're, you're good. There has to be, look at the individual needs. Is there trauma involved? Is there addiction involved? Is there rehabilitation in certain areas? And I think that's what we're lacking because there's not a system at the minute that I feel like caters to that, that caters to the individual needs. And we're just going to, like, even in England, just before lockdown, homelessness went from 207,000 and 207,000 to 200 and I think it was 237,000. So it's like, it's increasing and it's getting worse. And the thing is when the eviction kind of, and like housing evictions kind of aren't allowed or are allowed to happen now, we could be seeing a massive influx and rise and, and mental health has become a big issue during lockdown. So I think we don't even know kind of how severe this is going to be after. So I think therapy and counseling has to be a focus of the government, but also charities need to kind of start looking into that avenue as well yeah and like what what's your like opinion or view on like the northern ireland government like obviously like you're based in belfast like how do they deal with like the homelessness situation you obviously would be a lot yeah, more so in the like, know about it like. today at the minute we kind of work with the same community really well but there's fifty five thousand households currently experiencing homelessness which when i heard that figure i was shocked because i was like i probably thought it was a few thousand people now we did a lot of street team stuff and you'd maybe meet 20 to 30 people on any given night living rough on the streets but i think when you see it as fifty five thousand, you start thinking like right well where are they and i think that's where we need to look at how do we educate society to understand that term homelessness because some people might be living rough on a sofa and there's like sofa surfing that's a type of homelessness or there's people living in emergency shelters um like centenary house um like that's maybe 140 people living in there so i think we we're getting better at creating the housing for people like emergency shelters but the housing executive we probably need to work a lot more um there needs to be a lot of improvements there to see how can we get people because it's a point system and if you're a single male adult you're going to be on that system for a while waiting for a house and that's well that's what we find anyway so because it's a point system and also because of religion also areas that people maybe can't live as well i feel like northern ireland has that unique um problem that maybe there isn't just enough housing for people there's emergency shelter but not housing so I think 55,000 households, say there's two or three people in household, we're talking maybe 150,000 of a population over 2 million. And if you put it in that context, we probably all know someone that maybe they don't even know that they're homeless if they're like maybe living on someone's sofa, but technically that accounts to homelessness as well. That's a stark figure, la. Oh, yeah. I and I think that's, that. That, that's where we need to educate people to be even aware of like what but especially in schools like I feel like I don't know about you guys but like when I was at school we did not learn about money management or like oh. a mortgage or like how to look after yourself yeah. you're so focused on like geography and physics and maths and and these subjects but nobody's saying what the real world looks like after yeah. it so I think we've, for, had, we've had those conversations so many so times, many times. Like, about yeah. like money management and like you, like you're learning like obviously like English and maths and things like that are important but like when you're coming out like you look at the amount of people you know from like uni like just blowing money and getting in overdrafts and it's just like oh yeah get an overdraft like sort of like it's a joke you know i'm gonna go out in the pub and i'm in two thousand pound of overdraft and you're just thinking you're yourself, like bragging like, of who can spend the most in the night or who yeah. can use their overdraft the first the quickest but then like we had like Aaron McKellen on and like he was saying how he like used his overdraft to go over to LA and all that stuff like but like he says like like he's still getting out of it now today like you know yeah. it's crazy like so i think definitely there needs to be more done and i think our kind of focus at the minute like my i'd love to without saying i want to do so much more than just providing products like i know we did meals we partnered with delivery 
the last year. And we're looking to re-employment programs as well. We can employ people experiencing homelessness. But I would love to do like housing. I'd love to look at it holistically and provide whether it's outside in just clothing, then it goes into like hospitality and different elements and it's constantly mm -hmm. given back. But I think education is definitely one at the minute that we're trying to educate our customers and followers. But also I'd love to get involved in school systems to be like, right, can we actually create a, like a, an educational system here that people want to learn about it? Because I feel like if you call it money management, like when you're 18, that does not sound fun. But like mm -hmm. if there's a way that we can use like, I don't know, I, I love marketing, I love media. So it's like, can we not make it like so it actually is something that makes sense or you can look forward to and i know when i was in school we did economics and you got like fake shares and you got to like see how much you could potentially earn so like could we do it in a, in a way that's going to engage people who are younger i think that's the key yeah but like i feel like in school they're so focused on like i know the secondary school i went to a big one was llw and i was like just delving into your family tree and like yeah to some people that's important <laughs> but i'm thinking to myself why am i like I don't I don't care like I'm not really that yeah. in tune like I want to know because I, I I think I was always quite mature and wanted to know like how to manage stuff but then I suppose it's how you're brought up as well um like knowing how to manage all your finances and all that there to make sure that you weren't gonna be you know even getting into the same problems that we're discussing yeah you know what I mean? and I think because the big thing when we're doing the street team a lot of like there's a guy Ross he's incredible like He's amazing like just at communicating and helping people experiencing homelessness but he always said david we can keep pulling people out of the river or we can find out why why they're falling in and i think that's where we want to get to the source and i think if we can get to the source potentially one of those sources is probably lack of education in schools there's many other things as we we're saying trauma and stuff but if we can get to one source of education I think that should be a big focus. Um, so I, I don't know how we're going to get there. There's, we'll have to spend a few years of creating, like say, can we create a curriculum? Can we be part of the educational system in Northern Ireland? I have no idea, but do I you, think that's definitely something you, I'd be passionate about. Do you about. think like, because you, you're, you, you're obviously, you are young, like, do you think younger people in Northern Ireland have that chance to like get into, because what effectively what you're talking about there is like, getting in amongst sort of politicians and and having a voice and i think from over in england and stuff you're obviously seeing dr alex and stuff becoming yeah. an ambassador for mental health and stuff and like that there is a good sign like that's the sign that everything's progressing forward whereas we're still northern ireland still there's so much there's so much more being talked about and just leaving aside the essential stuff like what we're talking about especially mental health and stuff yeah i, I think because i've noticed that like like I've seen homeless peer Belfast and they've been advocating to make sure that there's period packs available for people who can't afford them in schools and stuff. And I think that's incredible. And I, I've seen like other people advocating. And I think social media now is becoming a platform where actually when people come together and rally behind something that then the government take notice. So I feel like there, there does need to be more done. I do think like the government needs to start listening to you young adults young people to realize like right what are the actual needs what are they need like because it's kind of like if we don't if we're say we're making clothing for like people who are young adults but we don't have like input from young adults we're going to create what we think is applicable rather than actually creating something that you, you need to involve the the people that you're you're wanting to target and i think that's where there's maybe a disconnect there within politics anyway i like i i wouldn't say i'd ever want to become a politician but i would love to see if we could be heard when it comes to the the topic of homelessness when it comes to education and schools um and i think there maybe is starting to be a change i think northern ireland is an exciting place like when i came here and started a clothing brand here it was like like flip like there's nothing really in the fashion scene but i'm starting to see in terms of whether it's podcasts whether it's um youtubers whether it's i'm starting to see a, a surge and a rise in people who are making a difference and who are kind of given northern ireland a name so hopefully that can even be in politics as well we can start to see a voice coming from from here yeah in terms of like the business side of things like obviously like streetwear is like a competitive market like uh, like there's no like endless amounts of streetwear brands like how do you find it like in terms of like the business point of view like how do you like stand out like 
or like marketing? Because I think when I started, I was like, right, because I used to work in Hollister in Glasgow. I'm not proud of that at all. But <laughs> when I was there, when I was there, I think one of the things that always shocked me was that it was nearly like tiered society. So we would be told like, right, make sure you're focusing more on this style of customer and not this customer. Um, and then when I looked into the guy who actually found it and heard that like a lot of the stuff that they were creating, like they were making sure that certain types of people are people in the poverty line trying to nearly say they didn't want them wearing it. And that really annoyed me. It's like, like I hate the fact that clothing creates status. And I think for me, it was like, how can I create a brand that actually levels the playing field and says, are you willing to be a part of a, a streetwear brand that people who are experiencing homelessness are also wearing? Because it's, it's like nearly the challenge then, are you going to associate with people who naturally society has put aside, but we're actually saying they have as much value and worth as you. So I think because we had that kind of connection and story that was our first part it was then like right because i have no fashion background or experience in that i think it was just like i love quality items so it's like i want to make sure the quality we're giving people in the streets is the same quality we're giving to our customer and i want both of those to be really high so i think if if we create high quality if we have a really good story i think that's it i wouldn't say like it has to be i because i've seen so many brands in northern ireland start and I, I hope there's more that do come because I don't want it just to be like two or three. I think we, I, I'd love to see more rise from that, but I think it really does come down to knowing why you're doing it. For me, it was a real motivating factor was I want to see more people experiencing homelessness have essential items and connect with people. I think people need to know, and there's no, it doesn't mean that everyone has to have a social impact attached such as we do, but I think you need to know why you're doing it. Like, is it because you're passionate about clothing? Is it because you um, want to put Belfast on the map for some reason? And it's a real strong motiva- motivating factor, but I think you have to get to the why you're doing it. And I think that's the motivating that keeps you going because when we started, there was a week, I remember in 2017, there was a week where we made no sales and that was tough. Like a full week, I was like, flip, I'm living at home here. Yes, there's not many like overheads, but I was like, it was one of those things is like, is this going to take off or not? Is this going to be something that people naturally gravitate to? And I think you have to fight past those moments because that's a tough mental barrier when you get to a week and you're like, flip, we've still no sales. But I went to like loads of pop-ups, set up myself. I was I was determined. And I think you have to have a resilience when it comes to setting up a clothing brand or streetwear brand because you'll get things printed wrong. You'll get the sizing wrong. You, you, you always think you've got it and then something goes wrong whether it's a launch or something so i think resilience is the big thing if anyone is looking to start a brand you have to have a sort of resilience to fight against all the things that potentially could not go right yeah one of the things like i find quite interesting with like people who started their own businesses is like i think like someone like yourself who's like created such a big sort of brand now like like people see now away or i like it's such a big thing but they don't realize like the grind that sort of talked to get it to what it is like like what sort of like what would you say was like one of the toughest parts where you were sort of like make or break if you know what i mean like you're sort of saying there yeah, about... like i think there's definitely a few moments like that um there was a f- like there was definitely one point where it was so the, this room I, i'm in at the minute is where you, this used to be like stacked to the ceiling with like boxes and I, everything happened here i would package like i was a well, one-man band doing it all yeah. um, i think there was a few moments where nearly you can nearly try to do it all yourself and nearly burn out so there's one moment where i like was trying to do it all and then took on well and i think that's where i was like flip you have to look after yourself as well um but i think one kind of moment was when we didn't have a warehouse or anything we didn't have this kind of filled up so much so that i was like we're kind of at that point where we are getting sales but maybe not enough to justify a place and that at that time was like working in bullet so it was like working there for like a month every day just having one flat white sitting in the corner really good wi-fi um but i was just kind of like praying like i need to find somewhere like or or i don't know what to do because i'd outgrown this space and there was there was nothing that we could afford um, but that's kind of when there was a place up in Belfast Work West and they offered to give us um, a few months to start f- us off for free. And that really did help us off to like get us off the ground. Um, and I think if it wasn't for people like that or other people who maybe just, there was another point, when the first Christmas market, we couldn't afford the stock. So it was just myself and we've been given this stall and they were like, look, we really want you to be here. I had no stock to put in it. And I was like, I don't know what to do here. I've maybe got like 10 or 15 hats. I was like, what would I do? And then it was Bothy up in White Park Bay. I actually held um, a movie night 
um, just so that they could fundraise so that there was money there to buy some products. And if they hadn't have done that, I would not have been able to to sell. Um, so there was, there's just a few moments where I look back and it's like if people hadn't have really believed in what we were trying to do, it would have been very hard to kind of get off the ground. And I, I'm still grateful to a lot of people who kind of at the start saw the bigger picture and the vision I was trying to create um, and saw that what I was trying to do and was like, I'm going to help you out here. So there are those moments where you just kind of think, do I give in? Like there was a moment at one pop-up I went to and we sold two items. Um, <laughs> I spent seven hours at it. So like there are those moments where you do question it, but I think you have to have that resilience to keep fighting. Yeah. You mentioned the Belfast markets there and like that's probably the first place I would have sort of seen. Re- like how big a part was the Belfast markets do you sort of like grow on as a brand? Like It was huge. I think the first year, especially 20, was it 2017 or 2018? That was the kind of one that like put us on the map because everyone after, like people didn't know the story. And I think that's where I got to be there every single day. And like, my strength wasn't maybe in like finances or admin or that, but it was communicating. So I got to like speak to people and there's some skeptics who would come up and be like, how does this help? Or this doesn't help at all. Like, or this is a scam. And then I was like, well, let me tell you the story of why I created it. And this is kind of what the wear one share one model is. And afterwards I told them that they've nearly like become strong advocates. So I think that was where I, and I, I was exhausted after that Christmas market because it was like every single day. And I, now I feel like it, it was kind of like retail, but it was like minus three degrees every day. And there was no like heaters. You weren't allowed heaters or anything. So it was very much like walking around, chatting to people. And I think that's what built the connection with people in Belfast to know that like, Flip, are you actually giving me the second product right now? And I can go down to Castle Court and give that to a guy I've just walked past. I think that was a real unique moment where we got to really show customers that it's like, this is about the giving or we had people experiencing homelessness come to the stall and it was kind of like we stopped people trying to buy at that point and be like hey this is where we now give and people could see that level of transparency straight away where products were being given as they purchased at the same time so i think i think the christmas market really did set us up in that first year to give us that brand awareness that then every year kind of we've went down there and there's nearly an expectation of like customers there every day kind of like traveling from all over Northern Ireland. I've had people coming from like, you know, Port Rush just down to the stall and um, to the cabin just to get their hats. Yeah. That's mad. Your stall is quite cool at the Belfast market to be fair. Like it's got, you got the big sign and all at the back of it. I think for me, it was like, I wanted it to be like a shop. I was like, I want this to look like if I did have, cause I, like I looked at like the retail thing. I was like, I want to fit in. I don't want to like, you come through like Royal Avenue and then you get to the top and you see like something that doesn't like, it just looks like a little tacky place. I was like, I want this. Like I nearly dreamed of what an actual store could look like someday. So I was like, I'm going to make it look like that now. So no, I, I do like how things look as well. I think experience mm-hmm. is really important. I think but, the branding as well is so good. Like it looks like a proper yeah. like clothing brand, if you know what I mean? Like how did it come about? Like how do you come about with a brand and say things like, um it was a guy up in Coleraine kind of helped me with it and like for me so the name was one of my friends he was like you're trying to get people outside into like housing and then the kind of the name evolved where we're like actually what we're trying to do is bring people on the outside of society in because they feel like outcasts feel like strangers and we want them to feel like actually you're a part of society and and you deserve to feel like you are and then oi was kind of like hey grab your attention like oi is kind of that little thing that it's like in Portuguese, it means, hey, but I wanted it to be like, notice me, like in terms of like when people are wearing it on the streets that it's like, you don't walk past anymore. You actually notice that there's a human there. Um, so it, there was a kind of battle with the designer, whether we put the oil on top or not, but I really liked that, like oil, like I, I just thought it worked well. And it was kind of like a playful style where I saw the outside end is quite street and serious. Whereas I saw the oil is like this little brush stroke that was playful and um, showed the creativity and even like the hope behind homelessness. because. I think homeless is always like seen as a black and white topic and it's real boring, like not boring, but it's like, it's just something that's seen as like real dull. And I was like, but there's these amazing stories of people like who are experiencing homelessness who deserve to be heard. There's so many hopeful stories that are coming out of it that can inspire people. And that's where that brushstroke effect was. Cause I was like, I want people to see there's creativity. There's, there's amazing talent. And that's kind of where like the branding kind of just flowed from that of how do we create this fun, exciting brand that's all about community um, and it's doing things a little bit different and it's sometimes different you stand out from the crowd or it's you have to like 
make sure that what you're doing is communicated well. But I think when you bring your customer on that journey of like, hey, what do you think of these styles or what? And, and like nearly they can see over the years, it's like, right, we've been involved in that process or we maybe let people pick between two fleeces we're going to drop and be like, which one would you like? And then we get a made six, like two, three months later. I feel like it's important to bring your customer alongside you to make them feel like I'm actually a part of this movement. Because I feel like so many people say join the movement or you're a part, you're a part of this brand, but like what connection do you have? Like what way is your customer actually contributing to what you're doing? Yeah. yeah. And with, with regards to like your sort of styles and stuff, like obviously you went from originally it was, was it just hats? Yeah, it started with just hats, yeah. Yeah, to then now you are doing like um, the the half, the, the wee fleece, yeah, like, like the half fleece. set. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we've kind of, I think at the start we were called the hat camp, the hat company or the, the, the beanie brand. And I was like, right, I don't want to be known as like, just I, I was scared of that sticking so it's like right we need to show that there's other things and i think the more we chat it to charities we realized there were so many different items that they needed so we we're like well could we not diversify this collection so that we're giving back socks or gloves or beanies or t-shirts and i think that's where like the 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 drive to do that came from the need and i thought i was like right let's just see what we could create here could we create a full streetwear brand and the thing i love about it is like we I see people like wearing the hopes we hope kind of sweaters and they're maybe like 75 and then I see someone wearing it and they're like 14 and I just love that it's like nobody feels like they're they're not cool enough to wear it and yeah. I think it's a hard thing to get because you should probably know streetwear very much is a certain aesthetic it's very much a certain style of person when you've got supreme and stussy and obey but yeah. I wanted this to be like how do you create a brand for everyone and it's like you still have to target certain people but I love seeing the granny wearing a hope sweet hope or wearing a dad cap or like i think that's mm. the part that i love about it it's like it's outside ends for everyone yeah and like in terms of like recruitment like how have you want from like growing your team like how much um i don't know how to put it like how much like thought like in the interview process to how much does it matter like their belief in like the whole brown like the homelessness and like or, yeah. or do you sort of just focus on if someone's that's a good, good that's a really good point because i think like it's one of those things that i realized like you're not going to be like are you passionate about homelessness on the thing if they say i haven't been like that suddenly you don't include someone in that i think yeah. very much it is about finding people who are empathetic so a lot of our core values are around like empathy dignity um like trust and i think if you look for those characteristics in someone like we have people who are maybe more like have been come from like the fitness industry because they cared about people's mental well-being or we've come from people who um volunteered at stuff and i think it's sometimes just looking at for certain characteristics that naturally show empathy because i think empathy is the driver for what we do but i also think it's important to see that maybe not everyone's going to be as passionate about homelessness as maybe i have been or some people are on the team but there's really important skills there that they can help contribute to the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. So there, it definitely is one of those things, like I see it as a family, as a team, like a real strong knit yeah. team. And I think we are very careful, like in the in the hiring process to make sure that it's somebody who's going to fit in like a high paced environment. Like, cause it's technically we're still a startup and like no day is the same, things change. And I think it's finding someone who fits that category. Uh, this isn't a tool I use, but I, I was speaking to um, a woman who's an entrepreneur and she said that she always asked in the interview process, do you shop in TK Maxx? And if they say no, then she doesn't hire them. Whereas if they say yes, she sees it as there's a lot of characteristics of someone who shops in TK Maxx who's very good for a startup because they're going to rummage through stuff. They, they find something like, but it's kind of that brain mentality of like, I'm going to be here for half an hour, but I might only get a t-shirt and I might only save three pound, but it was worth it. So I kind of like that. Also I, I might use it in the future. I don't know, <laughs> but I think you do have to be careful okay. who you bring in because technically they're joining your family and they're joining a bigger purpose. But I think skills are really important as well to make sure you have mm. that. So if we have anybody listening to this at the moment, <laughs> who's thinking of joining or get like a plan for sending an OECV that you're practicing your questions the night before and he's like mom asked me do I shop in TK Maxx <laughs> <laughs> what 
because this um, guy's not going to give me a job. I've given, away, I've given away one of our secrets now. There you um, go. You, do, you actually done a talk, me and Ross do marketing, and you done like a talk in one of our classes, like I think it was yes. last year. But um, I, I think I remember you saying, did you talk with Ben Francis, like the, C, the owner of Gymshark or something? Yeah, so I reached out to Noel Mack, who I think is their CEO or something. And he got back and was like, hey, look, we're actually having a, an opportunity to go around the headquarters. I think Gymshark's always been one of those like enigmas for me. It's like, how did he go from working in Domino's to six years later, a, a billion dollar company? And how did he create a culture that is so like, so like all around? It's not because I just I don't think it's just the clothing anymore. They've kind of created this like real like gym, like they find their, their niche in the, in the gym industry to find like athleisure, and I feel like they've created like a real strong bond that people are like Gymshark or nothing. And I feel like yeah. I, w- I wanted to find out what that was. So I did, I had the chance to go over to Birmingham to Sully Hall to see their kind of headquarters. And it was just incredible to see what he had created and how passionate he was. And um, yeah, I think they're definitely a big inspiration for me of how you can create a global movement of some, of some sort. Uh, obviously was- they've like got to that stage. Have you got like a, uh- goal that you set yourself that you want to achieve for, I, I for the want company? to be one of the biggest clothing brands in the world like i look at patagonia and um, nike adidas but I, I always think like could we be as big as that but have as much giving back at the same time and i think that's always the challenge like could we inspire other companies to give back um in different ways so i think the real driving force for me is like when we look at like LA or New York, I want to be where the need's greatest. And I think that's where I look at some of these major cities, Cape Town, um, Melbourne. And I think I want to be there so that we can make a difference there. And if that means expanding to do so, like that excites me. So I think I look at like Patagonia is a great example of how they are such advocates for um, climate change and how they've like given back to the environment that I think that's the sort of like size I would love to be so that we can I don't know, create an environment where people want to work and that people feel accepted and there's employment opportunities for people experiencing homelessness. But at the same time, we're maybe working in Skid Row in downtown LA um, doing like big giving back events and and maybe collaborating with other big companies there to be like, hey, look, this is a need in your city. Like we want to give back and, and show, show that there is hope for these people. Um, so I know it's a massive thing to say, like go from Belfast, creating a clothing company to becoming a worldwide company. But I... I I think it's possible. I'd love to see it happen in 10 to 20 years that we can kind of have that global establishment. Do you, do you feel like being from Northern Ireland, this is a conversation we always have. And I think it comes up from all the time because obviously what we're doing is it like people could look at and be like, why is these three, why is one, why is one guy from Balmina and two guys from Armagh starting a podcast? Like who do you think they are? Do you feel like Northern Ireland not dishing on Northern Ireland because I do love the country, but do you feel like you are on that sort of back foot? I think it's it's a weird one because I I I think it definitely at the start it doesn't. Maybe you find this. I feel like when you go to start something new or a brand new idea, like it could be even people close to you, like that's stupid or that's not going to work. Because when I started, the when I came up with the idea of like, oh, we're going to give people the additional product to give out, people were like, you're crazy. That's not going to work. Don't do it. It was near like I was expecting people to be like, yeah, go for it. Like, start your own company. Like, this will be great. Like, but it was the opposite. It was like, but then it kind of made me be like, I want to prove people wrong. Like, because I I believe this can work. So I feel like, and and then I've heard of like as companies go, there's like kind of this transition, like tall poppy syndrome in Northern Ireland as well, where they start like, as you get bigger, or you, you grow or something starts to work. It's nearly like people want to be like, right, okay, we were nearly going to support you at the start, but now that you're kind of getting there, we want you to kind of level off, like you're getting too big for your boots. And then you get to the next level where it's like the snow patrols or the JC Church, where then everyone starts like being advocates for them. Like, oh, like I've been a fan from day one. And I think we kind of need, to start celebrating that middle stage or even the earlier stages and be like, let's not just wait till like a few people break through the system and make it. Let's actually support the people who've just started or let's support the people who maybe are trying to break outside of Northern Ireland and see it as like, let's advocate for them as they move to London or advocate for them as they they grow. So I think there's those two stages do need a lot of support. And I, I think I get excited when I hear businesses starting in Belfast or podcasts starting because I think we come from a society that naturally limits not in the past is limited where we can go but that's why i love the dream of like 
creating a brand that's going to go around the world. And I, I think we need to start speaking it out. So it's like, we're saying it and we believe it. Whereas I feel like that's something that we naturally are nearly scared to say, because it's like, flip, if it doesn't happen, then everyone's going to remember that time I said it was going to be a big company and never did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, go on ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think I was listening to like the best of Belfast podcast and I can't remember who said it, but they were talking about like the whole Northern Ireland thing and people being successful and that what someone said was like, people over here want you to do well but not better than them and i thought that was pro- like i really thought that hit home was like oh, so true like yeah i'll help you up until the point and then it's like right but uh, like yeah you've kind of reached where i want you to be now so like supports over type thing i think yeah. there's i wouldn't say everyone's like that but there definitely is i feel like there is that kind of limitations that have been put in the past but i do think that's starting to break i do i think i i get really excited when i see anyone kind of doing anything because i'm like i want this to be a place known for creativity like i want people in five years time to be like flip people are moving because what really like hit home was when i went to gym shark was he ben was walking us through one of the rooms and he was like oh there's the marketing team um there's about five different nationalities there they all came over and they've moved here recently I was like, imagine Belfast was one of those places where we've got people coming from Italy or with people coming from New Zealand and they're moving here because of some of the companies or some of the channels that we've created that they're like, I want to be a part of what's happening there. I think that's exciting for me. So it's like, if we actually realize like we all have incredible potential, even as a population of 2 million, like imagine when it gets to the point where people are coming here because they've heard of the amazing things we're doing. Like, I think that'd be sick. Yeah. Well, one thing... I- one thing I was going to ask was obviously we we talked a bit about it there at the start. Thomas asked a question about like, and you made a good point, which is why this has come into my head. Thomas was sort of saying, was there any points, or it was Shay was saying, is there any points at the start where you kind of were a bit like set back, but it was at the start. But like you were saying there, um, so I forget you're exactly what you said, but you said like you're you're at a certain point, and then people will start to kind of try and rein you back in. Yeah. Was there ever a point like? almost say like you say you're that you say you're a startup but you've obviously been up and running for like four years four or five yeah. years was there ever a point where you felt like the trajectory was sort of going and such an upward and you were probably on a bit of a high where something sort of came in and took the wind out of your sales yeah, i definitely think there's a few moments where it's like whether it's other brands or whether it's like um like just people kind of questioning what you do or your motives or your intentions and i think that's where it kind of hits the winds in your sales, but you know why you're doing it. It's kind of like what I was saying there. It's like, if you know the charities and you know the people that you're helping know why you're doing it and they know that you're making a difference, you ha- it kind of like, you can be shaken, but it's like, what's your core? And if your core is strong, you're going to keep going. So I definitely think there has been moments where it's been like flip, people don't see what I'm trying to communicate here. But sometimes I think it's just down to the right, we, we need to even more show what we're doing be more like open to like communicate because actually maybe we've been really good on our social media but maybe we could explain more on our website or get more people involved so there's definitely been little moments i think where over the past few years where it's maybe there's been people who are skeptics and i think that's like i think that's always going to happen like if if you're kind of being like a salmon and you're going against the flow of the river there's going to be someone who's going to stop you and be like hey why are you going against the flow or why are you doing something different and I think you have to know why you're doing it or it really does can knock your confidence and be like, right, actually, maybe I should start going the other way and, and follow everyone because I don't think it's normal what we're doing. Like, I don't, the reason I think people have never done it for two reasons. I think that people are scared of what that could look like because they think, right, you're taking advantage of people experiencing homelessness because you're maybe telling their stories and then you're, you're like using them for that advantage. But I think that's where we've kind of really made sure like, right, we're A, we get people's permission, B, that we know the charities and we have social proof and because we've built real strong relationships with them. The other thing is like, I don't think anyone's tried it because you always have to have double stock. So if a customer's buying, I always have to make sure that there's a giving product ready to go if they decide that they want that second product to give out themselves. So I think like when it goes to events, like say we were going over to England, 50% of the van would be full of products for customers. 50% had to be the opportunity for people to give. And I think from that kind of like financial admin, it was crazy. Like as people probably, and, and that's why I think people doubted it and said, it's not going to work or that's not a long-term sustainable model. 
But I think that's where I wanted to fight that and be like, actually, we can give this away because I looked at the big companies and when they do like big discounts, it's like they were charging 90 quid for that and now it's down to 25 quid. Like, how do they afford to do that? But if your margins are there, that's where I was like, right, actually, we can create two products in there as well and still create a sustainable model. So I think it's it's looking at it and being like, don't always... I think it's it's important to have advice from people. I'm not saying like just go gun ho do your own thing, but I think it's important to who you listen to. And I think that's a big bit of advice is like if people care about you, they'll come and they'll do it in the right way. Whereas some people go straight onto social media and they'll say something. But we've had a lot of those people maybe who maybe naturally didn't know us and then we've chatted to them through social media. And then they're like, thanks so much for clarifying that. Like I'm going to take that story down because that makes so much more sense now maybe you should clarify this a bit more in your socials so there's things that we can do on our end and there's things that we kind of have improved over time but i do think there has been little moments like that across the past two three years that i would never say it's shit in my confidence to stop doing what i do because this to me is what i want to do for the rest of my life but i think it's more it makes you make sure that you are communicating everything effectively and you're careful who you listen to because not everyone's going to agree with it. And I think you have to, you just have to be okay with that, that not everyone's going to love your clothing. Not everyone's going to love your concept. Um, and you'll find this the same with you guys. Not everyone will naturally gravitate your, to your podcast, but there will be people who really do. And it's those people that you are making a difference to that's the important thing. Yeah. Fair. That was a good point. That was a good question, question to ask from me. High five. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing uh i think as well oh, i feel like my internet's cutting out here and that's why thomas is going ahead thomas i'll catch up no I, 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 just you mentioned there about the whole sustainability sustainability of the business like that's one thing i've sort of wanted to ask you is like obviously you just give the person an opportunity to give a product away like how difficult was that to like get a business model where you're selling the product, but then you're also giving it away free, if you know what I mean. Like, how difficult was that? To develop? It was tough because I feel like it was one of those things. It was like, I wouldn't do it any other way because that was the whole concept that we created. So it's like, I couldn't like not do it because it was like, the reason I'm doing this here is to connect people. But it didn't, yeah, as, as you said, it made it tough because it's like, I have to cover two products here in the price of that. And our margins are considerably then were less. Now, as we've grown, we've been able to buy, say, a thousand sweaters instead of 50 sweaters so then we can lower the price which means we can still get two quality products we can then invest in whether it's our social impact team or growing or getting a warehouse so it, it definitely has got slightly easier but it's still always a challenge and i think we've always had to the guys who have been in this from the start on the list we always have got really good at like doing things on low budget so whether it's like using a backdrop and then we've had it for like a year and we just reuse the, the heck out of that thing or we like make shift like a tripod or we, we you just have to get creative with what you have and I think that was the big thing we were just like let's not let let's not not having the equipment be an excuse to why we can't portray ourselves as an up-and-coming brand like let's show people like here's what we created but here's behind the scenes so the customer can nearly see like flip they don't act like I, I never wanted to create this perception like we were miles ahead of where we were. I was like, we'll create something really cool, but let the customer see what it actually looks like behind behind the scenes. So I think it was kind of never kind of at the start, it was tough because we didn't have big budgets for stuff or we could maybe only afford like our friends to be in shoots or that sort of thing. But I think you just have to be very careful with what you buy. You don't buy too much. Uh, the careful one and i've been the visionary so he's really been good at reeling me back in like say i go to buy a, a plant in ikea for the office he'll be like david like you need to make sure that we've hit our break even point today never mind buying a plant for ikea so he's like on the opposite end but it's been really good having someone who thinks like that because if not dear knows how many situations i'd have found myself in where i had like bought too many products or because i'm the one that's like we're going to sell out and everything's going to like be gone we're going to be like supreme and it doesn't always happen like that so i think it is important that you kind of manage your expectation and manage what you can do because you could look on instagram and cop o'clock and hype beast and all these and think like oh as soon as i drop this this is going to go and then you're left with 500 or something and then you're like right it didn't go and i told everyone like limited time only so i think you have to be careful how you portray yourself and you can't get too ahead of yourself and that's where that balance is really important as well yeah 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 um on that 
on the note of you were talking about Ben Francis there, as uh, one person who has seen promoting the brand, which I was a wee bit like, that's class, was Lewis Capaldi. Yes. But was there anybody else that, like, is there any celebrities who have, like, come out of the woodworks or, like, you've contacted uh, and they've been... Because I've seen Lewis Capaldi's one and it was hilarious, like, typical... Oh, he was he was crazy. Um, and he loved the brand. So, like, he was literally about to go on stage five minutes before that and he was, like, picking which hoops we hope jumper he wanted. Um, and, like, because his, his team were, like, here, you're on the stage. He was like, no, 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 wait, wait. And then he was like, I'm going to pick one of these. So it, he was an amazing one. I'm trying to think. We've had, like... We have had quite a few people. Meredith Foster's um, in California. She, she's quite um, a big YouTuber. We've had Bella Ramsey from Game of Thrones. Um, she would wear quite a lot of her stuff. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. There's 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 so many random ones, and we're finding like Jordan North. He's got a Hope So Hope T-shirt as well from Radio yeah. One. Um, yeah. But I think London, especially, there's a lot of celebrities who naturally help out a lot. Of, the homeless charities like that we work with and they've kind of like seen our products there and then they'd reach out and be like hey we were giving out your socks the other day we'd love to know more about the brand or is there any way i can help um so i think that's the exciting part is when like they just naturally come asking because they care as well and it's not like they just want a free sweater or t-shirt i think long term that's what i want i want people who really are driven by the the impact um, and those are the people long term like Bernadette's incredible and I think she's going to go on to amazing things as well so I think it's great finding mm -hmm. people who believe in it um, and even people like Lewis as well like he was asking loads about it because Glasgow homelessness is a big issue as well so I think I love those types where it's like a strong they love the product but they also love the reason it's we created it yeah so, is it not so, so surreal like looking back and like seeing celebrities like out wearing your stuff and thinking like where you started from like did you ever see it getting to this big if you know what i mean i think in my head i did right but i think like i always saw it and i was like this is going to be a global like i from day one i always believed it was going to be that but i think when it actually happens then you're like kind of hits home you're like oh flip like i don't know like gordon ramsay's following us on instagram or like some random like that where you're like you just don't expect Classic. it's like it, it's just those moments where you're like um it's real it becomes real i think because i'm very much a dreamer and i love pioneering and creating the vision of where we can go but i think it's those little moments that kind of do hit you back and back flip this is actual like this is actually happening but i to, to be honest with you like you see when someone because someone always asks like oh like what what gets you most excited when people send in stories of like new york or in la and people experiencing homelessness wearing our stuff by far the most cool thing ever because i think for me it's like we've work with charities like knowing that someone's actually given that out in those places or a charity's given it out and there's people like representing down skid row or representing in the middle of manhattan walking around that people are like knowing and communicating what outside ends about because if one person actually sent a story and they're like hey i bought five year hats last week because i was chatting to someone experiencing homelessness in london and i was asking them where they got their hat from and then they were able to tell the whole story of outside in and what it does and how like it helps that she was wow. so inspired by the person on the street that she wanted to go and buy from us so it's like i was like it's amazing when it's like the people wearing it on the streets believe in it so much so that they want to advocate on behalf of us and i think as much as celebrities can do that i get excited for like right when we're first going to launch a pop-up store in new york and we do like I don't know, there's 55,000 people. Imagine we could do 55,000 given products in the middle of Manhattan being given out by people. Before we open the store, we're like, we're going to give out all the products first because it's about this rather than like the Supreme where everyone lines up and it's like whoever gets there first or pays the most. So it's like, I nearly, I nearly want to flip on its head. I think it's great having celebrities, but when you have both kind of advocates, I think it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, what is the, was we're just going to maybe wrap it up soon. What is the kind of next step for you? Like, obviously you're saying you want to obviously take the brand globally, but like in your head, what is the sort of next goal? Um, I think this year, a big thing that we haven't really kind of made public public yet, but is the employment program. So I think I've looked at like the Given Keys in LA and Change Please in London, who are companies who have like started employment employing people experiencing homelessness some of them and transitioned like 120 some have transitioned more than that but i think like how cool would it be that you not only buy a product but you know that there's people behind that who are like making them who are 
kind of being transitioned out of homelessness. So I think the big thing is like, could we do that in Belfast? And that's where we're kind of chatting to a few charities at the minute to set up a system so that, because the tough thing at the minute is like benefits nearly prevent people from working because there's 16 hours and they have to work more than that. So it's getting, making sure that we create an, an, an incentivized pro program where people then can like actually come into our offices. We can train them how to screen print, embroider, um, they could maybe get involved in marketing and operations. So I think if, like, I nearly wanted that to be a big focus this year, like creating a really good system that's going to like outlast and it can be something we can show other like companies, like, hey, you can use this exact model and, and transition people. And then I think through that, we're looking at, at the minute, the next big step is workwear, like clothing for other companies. So it's like, right, we do quality clothing. We can like create um, the purpose behind it of like employing people. So could we do like 5,000 Google t-shirts and a little label on it says, every t-shirt has helped someone experiencing homelessness to transition. Like, I think it would be amazing if we could start working alongside. I think the best example is Carhartt. Everyone knows like, like Carhartt's that brand that everyone in America uses the hard wearing brand that like has everyone like has their logo on it and Carhartt's on the other side. But imagine like outside in and the always kind of the social proof that something's been done that's given back. So yeah. I think this year, if we can use that employment program and also workwear and clothing to work alongside some of the biggest companies in the world, I, I'd love to go like, like McDonald's and say, look, look, instead of you buying from dear knows who, come to us we'll create your stuff and you're helping people at the same time. Like it's a hard one to turn down if they know that we can match the quality as well. So I think that's yeah. the, big, the next big step that I'd love to do this year. Yeah, that's a class idea, that one. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. So I told you first before it's kind of announced. <laughs> Everybody always does this. I think this is a curse of this podcast. People come on and they're like, get really like quiet and they're like i'm gonna tell you something that like i haven't told anybody else and we're just sitting there going like you do realize this is going on the internet forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> but no that's that's pretty cool um so that's kind of short term sort of short term long term type plan anyway i think a big thing i'm looking forward to is getting back to events because events was always a massive part of our brand like we spend like most summers on the road, like literally had the van, traveled around England, Scotland. So I think once lockdown opens again, I'm really looking forward to like getting an events team again, like creating those little pop-up shops where we get to actually meet our customers. So I would love to fill a whole summer just full of festivals and different places where we can kind of go. And if we could maybe like try an actual pop-up shop in London, like Shoreditch or box park or something like that would be cool to do like a month of trying an actual store um, um because we've always done like the pop-ups where you like bring the gazebo and stuff and that's great and it but i think it'd be class to like say we had our first store now if i was doing that i want to do it differently like i'd want it to give back in a in nearly a way that people like change the way we view consumerism or could we have like an area where people can come in experiencing homelessness and get free coffees or they could they, maybe there are like some people employed there or experiencing homelessness. I, I love it to be different that way, but that would be our two short term is let's get back on the road with events and let's like create an actual shop for a short term. Yeah. yeah. You definitely seem to be full of ideas anyway. <laughs> <laughs> too many. I feel like I need a team of like 200 with the amount of ideas I have. Yeah, no, but this has been class. Like, was, like we've definitely learned a lot, and it's cool to be speak to someone running such a big like brand. Like, thanks so much. Honestly, but, yeah. and I, like you've asked amazing questions as well. Like, not that people on other podcasts haven't, but I feel like you've definitely got like the two elements, which is important because it's like we're all about inspiring people to help and kind of the motive. But it's also like I want to inspire people to like understand what it is to set up a business, and and hopefully yeah. that from this, other people in Northern Ireland can look into creating other like media streams or fashion brands or the more the merrier like there's there's always a there's always a space for that i feel i feel like a good place to end it is by asking you a simple question for like anybody listening to this what would your challenge be to them i think the big thing is like what is that thing that you dream about or you think about on your lunch or after work and is it your current work and if not I'm not saying like go quit your job and and start it but i think it's like start putting a plan in place where you can start wanting to achieve your dream not everyone has to start their own company some people may want to work for someone and maybe it's an aspirational company or it's more in what they're passionate about but i think if you're not 
like I think the worst thing would be to spend 40 or 50 years of your life doing something that you don't really enjoy. So it's like, what is it that you want to do? Why do you want to do it? And if you're confident in that, start that process of like in two years time, I want to achieve this or a year's time, I'm going to do it. But start now thinking of like, what's the small things? Can I start researching? Can I volunteer? Can I um, do a class where I maybe learn how to do graphics or illustrations? Like I think sometimes we find it the, the big goal is quite hard to achieve, but if we break it down into small steps, getting there, and that might be joining a course or getting a mentor, or asking someone how they did it. And I think that's where I think people need to nearly stop now. I think, am I happy what I'm doing? Is this my passion? And if it's not, that's okay. But let's start thinking about how you can get to do your passion. Yeah. Motivational. I think we'll end it there. Yeah. Thanks for coming good. on. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much anyway. And uh, yeah, uh, anybody who's not already following you or wants to go and check you out outside in on Instagram or... Yeah, so it's just we are OI. So we are OI, um, Instagram, website, Facebook, the whole lot. Okay. Go and buy some products. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. You're going to have millions on now guaranteed <laughs> we're gonna we're sell in. out overnight. yeah exactly you can afford to buy as many plants as you want and you can thank <laughs> us tomorrow <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> right thank you very much see you later guys thank you all the best